This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha and happy Valentine's Day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Pauline Schuckmark, Jr., your host for Outside In. Most people specialize in doing one thing in life, but some people like to combine seemingly disparate ideas and interests. For example, one person loves to combine medicine and art, and that is my guest today, Dr. Koan Jeff Baisa, an immunologist by training, a curator of art exhibitions, and one of the co-founders of the Honolulu Biennial. Aloha, KJ. Happy Valentine's Day. Same to you, Pauline. Happy <laughs> Thank Valentine's you. Day. Thank you very much. It's a bit gloomy today, but I suppose it's a romantic day in some respects. Yes. <laughs> so um, we've got a lot to cover because you do okay. several things, KJ. Right. And it might strike some people as a little bit odd what you do, mm -hmm. but you love two subjects the most. Mm -hmm. One is medicine mm -hmm. and one is art. Mm -hmm. So could I first ask you why you like to combine these two ideas together? Well, I've always been fascinated with the combination of disparate things. Uh, I like to think of it as drawing from the, uh, the fringes of the Gaussian curve. Mm -hmm. And so combining things has been a natural thing for me to, to bring disparate things together. So medicine and art aren't really as disparate as people think. There are many overlaps in terms of experimentation, the sense of wonder uh, approach. These are all things that uh, these two fields have in common. So. If you take someone like da Vinci mm -hmm. and other people, other Renaissance people, they've always mixed uh, science and medicine or science and art. And architects do that too. They Absolutely. use both sides of their brain in their daily activities Absolutely. in designing buildings, yep. mathematics and spatial awareness. Absolutely. So it's not so strange after all because no. um, I combine strange concepts like you and I That's always get that sort of half animal look when I explain <laughs> things like Freemasonry right. and Japan together. And exactly. Because I think most people, uh -huh. they kind of do a very mundane routine task that a mm -hmm. robot will probably take over mm -hmm. in 10 years mm -hmm. and their mind is not so open to this kind of concept, mm -hmm. whereas there are polymaths. It was more common to be a polymath a few centuries ago. Mm -hmm. People were a musician, and they were also an architect exactly. or something else. Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether it has to do with the educational system or it's mm -hmm. just not trendy, yeah. it's not promoted in society. What do you think? Yeah, I think primarily it's where a geographic location. I think in the US, people tend to think that you can't do more than one thing well, whereas in Europe and in Asia, there are many people, many professionals that are writers and musicians. I think there's a part of a cultural upbringing that's part of that as well. Okay, and why did you study medicine in the first place? What drew, what drew you to the medical profession? Well, primarily because we come from a family of uh, people who are caretakers in the health field. So we have physicians in our family, nurses, x-ray technicians, dietitians. And so that was the primary uh, reason for me to become interested in it. But also when I uh, majored in uh, physical anthropology and marine biology, again, two desperate su disparate subjects at university. It was, again, combining these interests. I actually went away from medicine for a while and then came back when I was in the Navy as a dental technician that allowed me to take care of people and that kind of caring and the, uh, the kind of uh, preventive measures in dentistry actually caused me to come back into a healing practice. I didn't know that about you, KJ, because yes. my father is a dental surgeon. Ah, so. Really? Okay. <laughs> you have something in common. Yes, that's right. A medical family as well, yeah. but not. I was the black sheep. I studied law instead. Uh, but I wanted to say, in, in terms of choosing the subspecialty that I did, first was pediatrics, because that was an area I felt that needed the greatest care mm -hmm. in terms of uh, preventive care, not the people not assuming habits that would abuse themselves. And secondly, because it's a field that uh, is very preventive, it's not organ specific, you're not just treating the heart or the lungs, and also very holistic, because you're treating a patient in his environment. You look at lifestyle, diet, lifestyle changes, mm -hmm. those kind of things. And that's what attracted me to the field. And KJ, you still see patients now, is that correct? No, I've segued from a clinical practice, which I had in California, New York, and Honolulu, into a tech-based practice. So now I, I work on a... Uh, a medical app called Medical Avatar mm -hmm. that's online, and it is a digital solutions company that addresses community health and corporate wellness. Okay. This I founded with a uh, fellow uh, uh, colleague in New York City, uh, Vic, you know, in New York City. And this is um, this is this business about the three-dimensional anatomical avatar of the patient. Well, that's Sarah, one. That, no, that's it. one yeah. aspect of it. We're using the uh, scanning techniques in health clubs to look at changes in body mass, uh, muscle volume, those kinds of muscle size, tracking that over time. My emphasis is uh, looking at the communication between physician and patient. 
There's a fact that doctors interrupt their patients 18 to 30 seconds into the interview, and then from that point commandeer the conversation. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. So I'm developing an app with Medical Avatar and Virgil Wong, who's my uh, collaborator in New York City, uh, to have an application called The Doctor Will Hear You Now. <laughs> it's a way to prepare. Yeah, it's a way to prepare the the history taking in a way that it's more digestible to the physician who needs to listen. Is it a particular kind of physician that does this? Because I can't imagine a psychiatrist doing that. That's a general. Uh, I was just speaking with a dermatologist uh, the other day, a very really good friend, Dr. Doug Johnson, who practices here, and he said that he's very aware of that in his uh, field as well, and so he's modified that to listening and examining patients as they're giving their history. So that is actually. An improvement. Why do you think uh, the doctors tend to interrupt their patients? Is it because they think they know better? Or? No, I think it's uh, the way we're trained. Uh, I think we're trained algorithmically and on keywords. And so when you hear keywords, your mind starts racing towards a diagnosis, hmm. putting things together. Really? Okay, uh -huh. because when I was in law school, we were taught how to listen. Right. So that's of not course. taught in medical schools as much? Uh, or you I just go into a. No, I think, if you I, see patient after patient, you get into yeah, a rhythm yeah. where you do this. I think we're, we're taught to listen, but I think that the, uh, the pressures of medicine now in terms of time and technology uh, put us in a different position than previously. Okay, now, li linking your interest with immunology, mm -hmm. uh, you specialize mainly in allergies, mm -hmm. is that correct? That's so correct. you're particularly fascinated by the sense of smell. Mm -hmm. And there is this Art of Olfaction Institute mm -hmm. in Chinatown in Los Angeles, exactly. which I want uh -huh. to see when, I, when we're both back sure. in California okay. at some point. Yeah. And why are you fascinated by the sense of smell? Because to be honest, that's the sense I would um, be most happy to be rid of. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would I'm be not. traumatized <laughs> if I lost my sense of sight. But uh, yes, sense actually, of smell. interesting you mentioned that because there are studies uh, with people who have lost their sense of sight and hearing and people would say they really um, develop depression. People who lost a sense of smell develop de depression, and there's a person with a band in Australia that actually was suicidal because of the loss. It has to do with quality of life. Oh, really? But if I can uh, segue to the beginnings, uh, I got into the sense of smell and olfaction area because of people that I saw in the allergy field with chronic sinus infections, mm -hmm. and those people lose their sense of smell mm -hmm. and affect their quality of life. And because of that, I was looking for links between the sense of smell and Alzheimer's, which is a type of memory disorder as well. Mm -hmm. And that was basically the link that got me from allergy into looking at more neurology in terms of neuroscience, in terms of links between memory and the sense of smell. And there is a link with Parkinson's, is that correct? There is. It's the first, the sense of smell is the first thing that's lost in both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And it should be a screening test for all physicians to, uh, to test for that. And there are testing uh, packets available. So for people, I know there are a lot of people in Hawaii who visit California or originally from California, such as myself. Uh -huh. So if they wanted to visit the Institute of the Art of Olfaction, mm -hmm. uh, can people go to a website and um, go visit? Uh -huh. You have yep. an exhibition that rotates? Uh, we have an exhibition, but it's also an educational site. Mm -hmm. We do have an organ, a mm -hmm. scent organ, which is actually an array of fragrances mm -hmm. where people can learn to make their own fragrances. Okay, brilliant. And uh, I guess that people can just Google the Institute of the Art of Olfaction. Actually, yeah. it's the Institute for Art and Olfaction. For Art and Olfaction. So if you go to uh, the web, you know, if you go to Google, you'll find it. It's okay. very easy. There, there's only one of its kind, <laughs> I'm sure. Exactly. Yes. Uh, now, uh, so you concentrate on the sense of smell in this particular museum and organization, mm -hmm. but you also uh, put on other exhibitions all over the world that mm -hmm. link science and art. So can mm -hmm. you give the viewers and listeners some sense of the combinations you've delved yeah. into in recent sure. exhibitions. Sure. Well, the science and art uh, also spills into other areas, but if I can point out certain areas, uh, I did an exhibition in New York City called Seeing Ourselves, mm -hmm. and basically that had to do with imaging technology and medicine and how artists deploy these, so artists are using MRI scans, x-rays, PET scans, ultrasound, in terms of their art. There was another uh, one that was very similar in which artists uh, use these techniques, but in a different format, which was presented during a photography conference in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of the things that look at the disparate uh, nature of things mm -hmm. is one called d'Afrique d'Asie, which is in <laughs> French, which means from Asia and from Africa. Yes. And a lot of people don't think of Africa and Asia in the same mindset. So the exhibition was about African artists and Asian artists 
looking at the ways that Africa and Asia are brought together in one mental uh, set. Is that only an American perception? Because uh, I lived in London for a very long time, mm -hmm. and London is famous for SOAS, mm -hmm. the School of Oriental and African Arts, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, is, or studies, I should uh -huh. say. Uh, but uh, th is that a, a perception only here? Because people no, don't no, not at all. I think it's a manifestation of you know, finding the artists who are actually working on it to make an exhibition. So it's widespread phenomenon, but in terms of an exhibition, it was easier to select artists uh, from New York. Okay, and uh, now we were talking about cephalopods earlier. Right. <laughs> so can we get to that? I'm very curious about this because it's intriguing. Okay. Uh, so you have in your notes cephalopods, but you've done right. an exhibition about octopi or something like this? No, there's, well, we can segue to collecting. I collect uh, images and objects of cephalopods. But the interest actually came, again, going back to my uh, original uh, minors in university and majors in university, which was physical anthropology and marine biology, actually work with cephalopods at HIMB, the Hawaii Institute for Marine Biology in Coconut Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, that combination of the two, or an example of the two disparate things that I was doing, putting together. Is the uh, cephalopod collection the largest theme in your collection? <laughs> no, uh, no, Why no. do you have this fascination with uh... oh, Because I've worked with them before. No, my collection is Catholic. I always say Catholic with a small c. Okay, yes. <laughs> which means universal. Uh -huh. And basically I'm collecting Ganeshas. That's one of my oh, passions. Okay, this is the elephant god, right? Uh -huh, that brings right. prosperity to businesses in India. That's right. He's the, uh, so if you want to be successful and prosperous in business, you pray to Ganesha. Is that he's right? a remover of obstacles, That's which is right. the reason I like him. But also I collect uh, Philippine gold, I collect textiles, uh, many different things. I, as I said, it has a... You're a bit like Doris Duke, except it's not <laughs> Islamic, it's Catholic with a small C. <laughs> I would say I live in an environment that's almost like a, a livable uh, cabinet of curiosities. Okay. Uh, and do you collect these creatures yourself or only in their art form? No, no. Okay. I, I used to collect them when I had a marine uh, aquarium okay. when I lived here in Hawaii. And also Is this something like Dr. No with the shark swinger? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It was a saltwater aquarium, which is very okay. common to have here. And in California, I had one as well. But the water is colder in California, so I installed my aquarium in a refrigerator. So okay, so now I finally <laughs> figured out why you travel so much, because I didn't realize how eclectic your art collection was. Right, yeah. uh -huh. And do you paint yourself? Is that why you love art so much, or do you appreciate the beauty? Have you tried to paint yourself? Or All of the of above. Yeah? All of the above. I love to paint. Okay. What do you like uh, to paint? Representational mm -hmm. is my area, and um, my kids have most of my work. They enjoy it, and okay. I enjoy giving it to them. Okay, and yeah. you have a favorite color? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> and uh, now, I remember when we were liaising about doing this show that uh -huh. you were doing something with amoebas, an, an exhi exhibition at LAX airport mm -hmm. with amoebas. So um, oh, maybe that... Was that in the planning, or it hasn't been executed yet? I think the amoeba reference was in terms of the way that I curate exhibitions, because there are multiple amoebas have pseudopods, mm -hmm. which are links outside of uh, protoplasmic links outside of the organism. So my shows are concurrent and multiple. Okay, brilliant, KJ. So we're just going to take a very quick break, and okay. we'll be right back after this break. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Soto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're speaking with KJ about his interest in medicine and art. So you are one of the co-founders, one of the three co-founders mm -hmm. of the Honolulu Biennial. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So the first time this happened, that's where I met you, uh -huh. uh, was last year. 
and you already have the dates for the next uh, one. And mm -hmm. this is March 8th through May 5th, 2019. So that's correct. And I had Marcus on, one of the artists. He's on Great. your advisory board. Absolutely. And we mentioned that the theme is an open boat. That's correct. And as one of the co-founders, mm -hmm. how did you how did you meet Isabel and Catherine? Is, is this, a, were you friends before? Was it by serendipity? Or oh, that's a very long story. It goes uh, back to 2010, I would say, way before the E. The, uh, the, even the first uh, iteration of the Biennial, you know that we had a chain of fire, which was a prelude to the Honolulu Biennial in 2014. It was supposed to be as a Biennial in 2016, but we needed more time, so we went to 2017, which was when you saw it, mm -hmm. you know. But I think that uh, the comment about the Biennial is that um, uh, it's very strong. I've always been supportive of it all along. I think it needs to um, you know, be recurrent, which is what was planned. If it needs to be recurrent, then it also needs to be continuous, needs to be sustainable. And I've always been an advocate of the Honolulu Biennial and the Foundation, and uh, would want to give a shout out to Scott Larimore mm -hmm. and Nina Tonga, who are the uh, curators uh, during this uh, next exhibition, and wish them the very best. They have my entire support. Brilliant. Okay, so it's honolulubiennial.org, and people can learn more about the upcoming uh, get get ready for the updates and things like that through it's not a newsletter but that you send email shots out regularly as uh -huh. the you can sign up on the website yes. for a newsletter that's correct okay great um, now you're a co-founder of that but mm -hmm. you basically curate you're basically a curator of the mm -hmm. other exhibitions that mm -hmm. you do worldwide right so how what are some of the upcoming exhibitions you've got mm -hmm. so people maybe if they're in that particular city or country they can go visit right well if you're traveling through uh, Los Angeles Los Angeles Airport LAX I do have an exhibition that's reopening in June of this year uh, through January, and that is called Wild Blue Yonder, and it addresses the color and concept of blue. Mm -hmm. So the concept behind blue would be religious, it mm -hmm. could be uh, thematic, it could be chromatic, and that's, uh, that's at LAX at uh, between terminals uh, 7 and 8, United Terminals. And you, you selected the color? Uh huh. Well, it was, a, it was a concept that I came up with, okay. and it was based on the wild blue yonder that's in the Air Force song. <laughs> See, that's why I asked you what your favorite color right. is, because most men, yeah. if you ask most men what is your favorite color, mm. it's some kind of blue. I think you're right. If you yeah. had to pin me down, I would say teal. Yeah, okay. A little <laughs> bit of green in there. <laughs> okay. Not the green bird like Buffy and Goldini. Okay, no, so, no. yeah, because um, it, it's quite common. My, yeah. my father's favorite color is sky blue. A lot okay. of men like navy blue. Sure. Some kind of, because it's very calming. Right. Uh -huh. And men generally are very calm. Yep. Right? <laughs> well, the exhibition I'm developing now with Keiko Hatano at Fish Cake mm -hmm. and uh, Lisa Sharoma, who's at High Sam Gallery Shop, Mori Art and Flea, have the whole thing in there. Uh, we're working on an exhibition at High Sam at that uh, the long title that I gave, and it involves artists from Hawaii and artists who have moved away from Hawaii. It's actually based on a small metal box that we're distributing to the artists, and the concept is similar to that of uh, Marcel Duchamp's mm -hmm. Valise en Boite, mm -hmm. um, and also Tom Clovey's Shoebox series. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, an exhibition that's going to open on the 4th of May, during First Friday here in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and they were very excited because we have some very exciting artists involved in it. Okay, so apart from uh, Hawaii, any other U.S. state or abroad, any other mm -hmm. country you're delving into at the moment? Well, there are projects I'm developing in several countries. I, I'll name just the countries as mm -hmm. describing the exhibitions mm -hmm. will be a bit long. Outer Mongolia, mm -hmm. Punjab province in India, very nice. Bangkok, uh -huh. uh, um, Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is Kinshasa, uh, and Fukuoka, Japan. Oh, good, because yes. we are a sister state. All right. Of, yeah. Yes, Fukuoka Perfect. and okay. uh, Hawaii are sister states. Great. Uh, and that's very good. We have a Japanese link. So you're focusing on Asia. Uh, any European ones in the works or in the future? Well, I've done recent, I mean, these are uh, future projects. This past summer, I did exhibitions, two exhibitions in Vienna, mm -hmm. then also traveled to Krakow and Dusseldorf and Berlin uh, to set up exhibitions as well and residency programs. That's something I'm very interested in doing yeah. as well. Yeah. And how do you select your artists mm -hmm. for the exhibitions? Do, do, they send, do they know of you and they send material or images of their work or do yeah. you source them from something catches your eye? And All of the above. Yeah. All of the above. I'm really fortunate to have been invited to be on several arts organizations mm -hmm. on the boards of them. And so I got to do a lot of studio visits. I got to look at a lot of work, either in uh, online 
or in physical form. Mm -hmm. I would say I probably see up to maybe a thousand artists uh, a year in terms of their portfolios just That's because I'm, yeah. yeah. But what it allows me to do is build what I call a Rolodex of information. So I catalog the ones that I like and keep them in mind for exhibitions that come up. I have more ideas than venues, and so mm -hmm. I have <laughs> ideas cooking all the time. So I ain't looking for a venue funding supporters for that. That's what moves it along. And but ideas are, I don't have a lack of. Sometimes extremely talented artists can yeah. be very difficult to work with, mm -hmm. uh, like a highly highly skilled chef in uh -huh. a very top yep. restaurant. Sure. They're very temperamental sometimes. They so can be. Do, do you have be. an attitude check or something like that? Do you, mm. do you Even if an artist is extremely talented, mm. is there a point where you just, uh, the person, ha the character of the person has to meld with you as well? Uh, or well yeah, is this a difficult call to make? Well, it is a complex question, but if you you can make an analogy as to choosing, say, a surgeon, mm. you know, to have an operation. He doesn't have to be the nicest person. He uh, doesn't have to have a great bedside manner. If you're confident in his technical skills, you will select that person. Mm. So along with artists, I would select mainly for quality. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. And of compatibility. If it's a person who's difficult to work with, it's, uh, you know, it makes the the exhibition uh, harder to pull together. Yes, your analogy of surgeons is quite useful because among all the medical disciplines, the surgeon is the one most likely to be a psychopath. There's a higher... <laughs> there's a higher <laughs> I didn't know that. There, there's an increased <laughs> number of people with psychopathy in the surgical area. Really? Okay. Yes, which makes them good because a book came out that says The Wisdom of Psychopaths because psychopaths uh. can actually do things other people can't in an organization. Mm -hmm. um, they're very decisive. Uh, they can hire and fire people at a whim right. uh, because they don't... They, ha they lack conscience. So they can actually move things along quite quickly. They mm -hmm. do have their attributes. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's a good analogy yeah. to bring up because artists can be like that too. So <laughs> but so quality is first. That's yes, quali quality is sure. number one. Uh -huh. um, now, obviously, uh, you travel quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I know that. Um, and uh, you must go to an awful lot of museums yourself to get ideas about exhibitions, how to mm -hmm. do something in a novel way, how to do something in an in innovative way. Mm -hmm. um, because there are so many galleries and museums now, it's mm -hmm. very trendy. Uh, so uh, is there any particular museum anywhere in the world that immensely impresses you? Or there is a particular way the, the, the founder or the curators put on permanent or temporary exhibitions? Well, I think the sources of inspiration for me are, are legions. So it's not just museums, you know, it's galleries, it's walking around in the open, going to the wilderness, going to the desert. Mm -hmm. and I'm uh, co-founder of the Joshua Tree Neal, mm -hmm. you know, in the Mojave Desert with Bernard Leboff. And so that's another source of inspiration. Um, but if I can come back to, you know, your original point, you were asking about other sources of inspiration, like yes. a museum. Mm -hmm. I would have to put one that I haven't visited yet, and it's called Mona, Museum yes, of New yeah. and Old Art. I've been there. Okay. It's, I showed you the picture of how the uh, yes, David the Walsh parking, marks the parking his parking spot. Space. Right, yes. exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. So I have a, I have a personal link uh, to uh, the person there. Yes. And uh, so I'm hoping to do an exhibition. I'll visit it first, but also to do an exhibition is one of my dreams. Yes, you, you, KJ, you are aware that I'm not a fan of contemporary art. It really <laughs> depends on what it is. Uh, but right. I have to say Mona is extremely impressive. Mm -hmm. So if your brain switches off at Michelangelo or the classical arts, mm -hmm. it's really worth it to go to Hobart, to, mm -hmm. to Tasmania, mm -hmm. and see this magnificent, he's really done a wonderful job mm -hmm. because they're very unusual installations and exhibitions. Sure. Uh -huh. and they are contemporary, but they get you thinking. It's, it's yeah. even even if I'm I'm very hesitant to go to such things, but I loved it when I spent the whole day there. So it's really worth it. And also, you must go to an awful lot of art fairs. Mm -hmm. um, so we have several of those in London: the, the antiques fairs, the art fairs. Mm -hmm. Are you a fan of antiques also, or you, not I so collect much? antiques, but I'm not uh, I'm not a fan of going to the fairs for antiques, so like Maastricht, like uh, those. Okay, so <laughs> on the on the medical side now, yes. you're focused on medical avatars, is that uh -huh, correct? Uh -huh. Any other medical projects uh -huh. at the moment? Well, the medical projects besides medical avatar have to do with the sense of smell and its relationship to Alzheimer's. As we talked about before, it's the first sense that's lost mm -hmm. in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. I was supposed to do a, a project with Oliver Sacks. We were both on a panel at MoMA together mm -hmm. in New York. Unfortunately, he passed. Yeah. But it is an interest of mine in how to link uh, curative things from the sense of smell, the olfactory field, with Alzheimer's or other neurodegenerative diseases. Are you going to write a book, or is purely in the exhibition category, the art exhibition category? No, it's actually linking up with actual researchers at NYU and Columbia. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, the book I'm planning on, The Olfactory Sense, has to do actually, it's a primer of olfactory um, diagnoses. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a book with smells that will train doctors to detect certain medical conditions based on smell. Mm -hmm. For example, there's a very characteristic fishy smell to a certain uh, uh, disorders of metabolism in kids. Mm. There's also ketoacidosis, people more familiar with it, in mm -hmm. diabetics. Yes. yes. There's a certain type of smell with pseudomonas, which is a bacteria that causes infections. Mm. So these are the types of things I think could be of interest and also instructional for physicians. Okay, and do you do anything related to perfume? Because that's the, that's the nicer side of the sense of smell I personally like. Uh -huh. yeah. yes, <laughs> I'm not I so keen on the other <laughs> the bacteria things you're talking about. <laughs> well, they're part and parcel of the same yeah. spectrum. Yeah. But I have worked with the perfumers at major perfumed uh, companies like IFF and Firminich in New York City and have done exhibitions on the sense of smell themselves. Okay, and yeah. you have a particular, I, I know a lot of men, they like a lot of sandalwood in their cologne. So mm -hmm. do you have a particular scent you favor? Uh, not really. I'm, uh, again, I have Catholic tastes, so my oh, right. taste in perfumes. <laughs> uh, in <sense>. yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, actually, oud, I would say, is one of my favorites. Oh, oud, yes. Oud mm -hmm. is very yeah, favorite. Eric, yeah. But also, I'm trying to get someone to mix pink peppercorns and uh, pomegranate with me and see what can come up with. Oh, yeah. So I yes. think they do that with macaroons. So <laughs> you can do anything with that. Your peppercorns are very useful. No, I think and that would be an intriguing smell. Yes. And uh, your links to New York, did you have a gallery there? Is that right? Or no, not at no? all. I was drawn to New York because I'm probably the only physician that applied to and got into the Whitney Independent Studies Program, which is a one-year non-degree awarding program associated with the Whitney Museum. So that opened up my entire world of, uh, of curating because it introduced me to so many curators and artists and critics. Mm -hmm. And I stayed on in New York. I opened a clinic. I was actually providing free medical care for artists, uh, uninsured artists in New York. Mm -hmm. That was my community service. Brilliant. But at the same time, was curating exhibitions uh, throughout the world based in New York. Okay, that's fascinating, KJ. Yeah. And I, I love guests that have more than one thing going. <laughs> if I could tell anybody, you know, it's easy to do. It's not that difficult. You can mix the two interests together. Yeah. And uh, thank you so much for being a guest on yeah, this Valentine's pleasure. Day. Happy and Valentine's Day. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day again, everybody. And I'll see you next Wednesday on Outside In at 2 p.m. Aloha.